This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please support us on Patreon over at patreon.com slash geeks or via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. And I want to give a special thank you to Martin, who just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so now let's get to our show. Hello, and welcome to episode 571 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Today on the show, we'll be discussing the new Alex Garland movie, Civil War, about a civil war breaking out in modern-day America. And this will involve spoilers for everything in Civil War, so just be aware of that. And I'm joined by two guests. So first up, we've got Mike Cole, making his sixth appearance on the show. He's the author of military fantasy novels such as Shadow Ops Control Point, epic fantasy novels such as The Armored Saint, and military history books such as Legion vs. Phalanx. After a career hunting people in the military, police, and intelligence services, he put those skills to use on two TV shows, the fugitive hunting show Hunted and the UFO hunting show Contact. His most recent books are The Bronze Lie, Shattering the Myth of Spartan Warrior Supremacy, and The Killing Ground, a biography of Thermopylae, which he wrote with Michael Livingston. So, Mike, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me back. And also joining us today is Michael Livingston, who you may remember from our feature interview back in episode 532. He's the author of fantasy novels such as The Shards of Heaven and Seaborn, and history books such as Never Greater Slaughter and Crazy, Battle of Five Kings. He's written a book-length study of the Wheel of Time called Origins of the Wheel of Time, The Legends and Mythologies that Inspired Robert Jordan. And he also appeared on the Discovery Channel show Contact, where he served as part of a team investigating UFO sightings. His most recent book, which he wrote with Mike Cole, is called The Killing Ground, a biography of Thermopylae. So, Michael, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Okay, so let's start off with Mike and have you tell us about your expectations going into Civil War. So, um, you know, obviously this film got a lot of buzz and most of that buzz uh, just leading up to it and even shortly after it came out was highly connected to our own political moment that we're experiencing right now where we had, you know, big breaking news last night. So I really expected um, both from the commentary. Well, seeing, Mike, why don't you just say just for people who might be listening to this in the future, what the big breaking news was? Oh, so we just had the, the big breaking news of, of, of Trump's conviction. Um, and so I was really looking for a film that was going to be dealing with all of the anxiety and the tension that we're feeling about the I think what we what most people will agree is is a, an unprecedented level of political instability in the United States. Um, so I, I won't talk about how those expectations were met, were met until it's time. But that was what I was thinking I was going to see going in. Uh, so d- did you have any expectations based on the fact that this is an Alex Garland movie? Do you have any opinions about him? I mean, look, I, I, Ex Machina is just sheer brilliance. Um, and 28 Days Later, I mean, Alex Garland is just a, a superlative storyteller. And he specifically deals in post-apocalyptic themes with just incredible expertise and, and real flair and, and artistic ability. So I just expected it to be an absolutely banging film. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Alex Garland is definitely one of my favorite. I mean, you know, Alex Garland and Denis Villeneuve have just been, you know, putting out the best science fiction movies of recent years. Um, yeah, I, I think that's I, I definitely uh, I definitely agree with that. I mean, Ex Machina is and so chilling, like what a wonderful, wonderful movie. Yeah, yeah. And so Christopher Nolan is kind of in there as well. But um, but yeah, I just really like Alex Garland. I interviewed him years ago. I thought he was a super cool guy. So um, yeah, so I was definitely inclined to to like this movie, um, you know, based on the fact that he wrote and directed it. Um, so how about Michael? What were your expectations going into this movie? Uh, you know, a, a lot like uh, Mike, I was, you know, expecting this to to kind of reverberate with with what we're dealing with in the country. But knowing, you know, that Garland did it um, and knowing kind of how he approaches things, uh, I really was expecting uh, something that, that would not be, um, I would say, kind of like a shallow, responsive, uh, reactive kind of film. 
um, I was really on the lookout for, uh, you, you know, what is kind of a deeper, uh, almost kind of like more, more philosophically inclined, uh, reading of, of, uh, of this potential issue of a, of a second civil war. And, you know, as, as you, you both have, have said, you know, I mean, you know, Garland is, you know, a filmmaker who really, uh, is fantastic at, um, kind of incongruities of, of, of film. Um, Ex Machina is amazing. Annihilation. It, you know, he, he really is very good, um, especially at kind of producing sort of bucolic images that are then undercut with, uh, you know, feelings of, uh, of, 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 I don't even want to say absurdity, but, you know, like things are broken. Um, and I thought, you know, that, that would be really good um, for this kind of film. So I was, I was really interested in, in what that was going to look like. Um, I didn't, I did not think that it would take much of a stand, um, uh, you know, relative to, to current politics as, as far as taking sides, just because it, um, I don't know, I, I, my feeling was that just wouldn't be the way that a filmmaker like him would, would approach this. So, uh, I really just was interested in it as, as a work of film. Um, cause again, you know, uh, Garland is, is, is so good. Um, I think, you know, Denny is, Denny is like, a deity to me. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, Alex Garland is, is without question, a, an amazing filmmaker. Yeah. So, so as I said, I was really, really looking forward to this movie. And so the first trailer came out and, you know, it features a clip by the, the fictional president in the movie saying, um, you know, the West, something about the Western forces of Texas and California will be defeated or, you know, something like that. And so, yeah. so in, initially you're like, what, <laughs> like what is the setting here? It's like somehow Texas and California are united against the president, right? So I don't know. Did you, um, Mike? Did you um, watch that trailer? Were you following any of this? Sort yeah, of pre- pre- I, I, I did, and it, it it tempered my expectations quite a bit um, because um, first off, like the even the, the speechifying that I heard from Nick Offerman playing the president there was so Trumpian that I was like, okay, this really confirms my expectations that this is going to be a nod at our current moment. But then again, you had that discordant note of the, of the Western forces. But most of what was covered in that trailer was action clips from the final scene. You, you know, you see the um, low flying helicopter, um, in the city streets of DC. And so I was sort of like, then I was kind of like, uh, I don't, <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen here. Um, and I, and what I was seeing didn't like evoke a cohesive narrative for me, at least in that short trailer bit. So that actually tempered my expectations a bit. I mean, so, okay. So, so you go to see the movie and so it starts off with Nick Offerman, who's the president sort of, um, uh, rehearsing a, a, a bombastic speech he's about to give about how the, the Western forces will be crushed. And so, so so yeah so the setup of the movie and this is not a hundred percent clear um, in the movie itself but but basically yeah Texas and California have both seceded and then sort of the states around Florida have seceded and there's something called it's like the Florida Alliance or something and then sort of some states in the Northwest have seceded and then kind of everything else is still nominally under the control of Washington D.C. and so. Um, yeah. And, and so so the president, this Nick Offerman president is giving this speech. And so I guess, I don't know, I didn't, from the trailer, I don't know if I got the Trump vibes so much. I mean, I, I it, when he was rehearsing the speech, I initially felt, I was wondering if we were supposed to feel sympathetic for him because, you know, we're starting off with this character. He's obviously under a lot of stress and everything. And so I had at least a little bit of a sympathetic connection with him as the movie started. Um, when I rewatched the movie last night, the, the thing about, um, you know, this is going to be the greatest victory in the history of the world or something right, definitely, right. <laughs> definitely struck sort of a Trumpian note to me. That's but, what um, I was, that's what I was referring to specifically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but so kind of what were your initial impressions of, of kind of the film as we, so, so we, so we watched that and then we almost immediately cut to the, a group of reporters in, um, in a hotel in New York city who were kind of talking about covering all the, um, unfolding chaos. So what were kind of your initial impressions of the film at that point? So like, right. So, I mean, look, if there's one thing that Garland and Mike pointed, Michael pointed this out is that Garland is the master at making you uncomfortable, right? Like it has this creeping reality to it 
um, which really unsettled me. In fact, when you, I think I told you when you, when you first, um, we discussed me, uh, coming on the show and watching it, like I, I, you know, had some reservations just because, you know, I have some background in, in this. Um, and, and he's just brilliant at that. The scene of the water riot uh, in New York City that the film largely opens with the power coming in and out and those kinds of things, um, reminded me of like, you know, the, the safe, and I'm, I'm using scare quotes here, spots, uh, in Baghdad when you, when you first uh, came in. Um, and it's really, uh, you know, really unsettling. Um, but one of the initial sort of, um, disappointments for me when I was coming into it that I, that I struggled with was I was kind of like not gripping on to what the, um, coherent narrative was in the beginning. Like what's, you know, what is this movie about? that I wanted to take possession of um, really, really quickly. And the other thing that I was struck by almost immediately is as they start introducing these things, the Western forces, um, they mention the Antifa massacre, and there's sort of no notion of whether Antifa did the massacring or was massacred, and and such focus on the journalists. And the, and they're, they're um, sort of Lee as this kind of jaded, um, you know, uh, and, and, and Jesse is this bright young thing who's coming into it. And I'm sort of thinking about that and being like, oh, 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 this movie isn't about a war at all. The war is a backdrop. You know, there's something else going on here. So I was, I was, I became immediately, I was kind of thrown off balance and, 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 um, and very, very curious as to where it would go. Yeah. So, so just to explain. So, so the, we have sort of four journalist characters who were following. Um, and so, so Michael, why don't you tell us what were your kind of your initial impressions of of those four characters? I, I thought that they were uh, sort of a fascinating blend, right? You you have Lee and Joel, who are uh, you said the two kind of primary protagonists, um, and work together. Um, and you then have an older kind of mentor figure, uh, Sammy, uh, who works for what is left of the New York Times. Um, and, uh, and then this young, uh, would be a photojournalist who wants to follow in Lee's footsteps, Jesse. Um, so you you have a sort of, uh, sort of a, a cross section there of, of those who have kind of, you know, seen and done and those who want to do. Um, and it, and it does speak, you know, I think ultimately to kind of what the film is doing, um, and what, you know, and what it is, right. It's a, as, as Mike said, it's, it's a film, obviously it's centered on a war, but it's, it's not about that. Right. That that's why it refuses to explain how, how on earth is it that the California and Texas are working together. Right. Like that. And, <laughs> and that, and that, like that, that tension that you get, because, you know, in, in our world, you're like, no, no, those, that does not, those are diametrically opposed. And here in this, this kind of, you know, essentially kind of fantasy world, um, it's, it's been constructed. It doesn't matter, right? It, 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 the war, what has caused it, why these forces against those forces is sort of really beside the point. Um, you're really seeing, um, an, an attempt to, uh, to, to beg the audience to pay attention to journalism, uh, and to journalists in these most dire moments, um, what they're going through. Um, and, and their importance, which is something that, that is kind of speaking to our world. Um, and we can, you know, talk later about whether or not I think it really kind of succeeded at that, but, but I really felt pretty quickly. That's what this is about, right? You know, that's where we're centered. That's what we're seeing. Um, that's what I'm trying to get out of this. Um, so I thought it was a cool cast. Yeah. Well, let's just talk about the Texas, California thing for a second, because Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, like I said, you see the trailer and you're like, this makes no sense. What the heck, you know? Um, but, but you said, Michael, right, that you, you did not expect this to take a side, like a left versus right side. Right. And so one sort of, um, advantage of having this Texas and California United set up is that it, you know, it instantly complicates the idea that we're going to root for the left or the right side of the political spectrum and kind of anyone going to the movie doesn't know, you know, how to feel, um, about, about what about the situation and so i mean i've heard alex garland talk about this a lot so i could you know i could explain his reasoning i guess but i mean we do have a lot of situations in history like like the allies in the soviet union um allying to fight hitler 
where where war kind of makes strange bedfellows, right? So do you see this as plausible in that sense that if the, because I think this is the intention of the film is that this president is so unacceptable across the political spectrum and has become so reviled that even the most left-wing state and the most right-wing state in the union um, will put aside their differences to try to oust him from power? Is, is there that question for Michael or me? Okay, how about Mike? Why don't you get back in here? Okay. You can um, answer that. So, right. So I would say that would have been true in the 40s, um, but in the um, age of uh, hyper-partisanship and social media and division that we see today, it just, that didn't strike me as, as uh, likely. Um, and I'd like to, if I could, um, bring up the Stephen Marsh interview that you did. Do, do you happen to know um, the episode number and, and or date of that? Yeah, yeah, I have it here. So it was, ep- it was episode 512, and it was 2022. Okay, great. So in his book, The Next Civil War, which is a nonfiction book, he, he really bases it off of interviews and strategic models from, um, you know, from, from, from military plans that are, are charged with dealing with this. And one of the things he talks about, and I love this term, is psychometric alignment. Um, and he divides the United States. For example, he, he pairs the Midwest and the South together based on, um, ideological union. Um, and, one of the thing, one of the reasons that, that I really buy that now, where this idea of, of war making strange bedfellows in the past is less likely to me than it was in the 40s, is again because we really are, especially in the United States, but also globally, it, it really in an age of, of um, intense hyperpartisanship um, along political and, and ideological and, and even ethnolinguistic lines, to the point where I, I think it's um, it, that could be a real obstacle in, in effective collaboration, especially military collaboration. I mean, do do you guys have some alternate ser- scenario that you could imagine that would that would be a sort of more plausible American Civil War that would not make the movie come across as really partisan or or anything like that? I, I don't. I mean, you know, inevitably. You know, we we do have a lot of people in this country that are like itching for another civil war. Um, a lot a lot of people want to cosplay that. Um, it, but when you when you actually try and sort of break down the likelihood of of this, I, I um, you know, Marsh in his in his book uh, does some amazing things. Um, I, I personally think he's a little bit too uh, too too expectant of it of it hitting in reality. Um, in, in large part because most people, uh, you know, when it comes down to it, kind of understand that that this they, they can't have this and also have their Amazon packages show up on time, um, and and so it's it's pretty unlikely to get that kind of full scale. You, you know, violence, yes. You know, pockets of violence, yes. Um, but the kind of uh, you know symmetrical warfare that would be required, uh, you know, to have kind of state by state breaking up pretty unlikely. I mean, you know, extremely unlikely, I would say. Um, in, in the movie, the kind of excuse for, for California and Texas being pushed so far that they'll work together, uh, at least as I understood it, is, you know, that this, that this president, uh, Offerman has, this is easy now, his third term, he's ripped up the constitution, right? You know, and that this is so far beyond the pale. That, that, yeah. that they're willing well, to we'll say we're together. told that he's disbanded the FBI, presumably because they were trying to investigate him and <laughs> that he's launched airstrikes against civilian targets in the United States. I mean, those are the, the, right. the data points that we that we get. Right. Um, but, you know, then like this, you know, why is the, the Second Republic of Texas not working with the Florida Alliance? You know, we, ju- we just don't get a lot of details on all this. And it, it again, it really just to me, I think, you know, Garland is just like, well, here's a way that I can cut the map up. That will uh, immediately prevent my audience from taking a side, right? The, and and therefore the movie's not taking a side, right? And and that part of that I'm sure is a you know a commercial decision, right? You know I mean if I have half my audience walks into this movie and five minutes later you know wants to shoot the place up, that's bad. <laughs> um, but also it's you know because it's it's not about that, right? You know, it's not about this moment. Yes, it, it, you know, it can respond to this moment, but it's not about this moment. It's not limited to this moment. Uh, you know, so I, I do think that he's been very careful about that, right? You know, I mean, Marsh is, is, is trying to kind of look at it kind of more realistically, right? You know, this is a, a realistic outcome in, in, in his view or a possible yeah. one. Uh, so they're well, really different. What, 
Yeah. Well, why don't we come back to the the bigger issue of what the movie is trying to say and what what it's about, you know, as a whole. And just I want to get back to the thing about the journalist characters because, you know, yeah, like the the movie focuses really heavily on these journalist characters, and Alex Garland obviously has a lot of affinity for journalists. I mean, I just know. Uh, his, his father was a political cartoonist for newspaper. He has a lot of friends and like friends of the family and family members and stuff who are journalists. And he said that he, there was actually this really interesting story where as a, when he was, you know, 19 or 20, he would actually just buy plane tickets to foreign countries and sort of go as a freelance, like war correspondent, basically, you know, just find whatever the biggest, biggest, um, rally or whatever was going on and and try to kind of insinuate himself into the coverage of it like the like the jesse character in the movie and in real life you know uh, an, an older journalist after he'd done this a few times took him aside and said like kid get out of here we don't want you here and he sort of took that advice and went home but uh but this is something that obviously he uh is interested in and cares about a lot um it's and, fascinating, Dave, that that is how um, Sullenberger, uh, the, the famous journalist who Sam Harris just interviewed on Making Sense in his latest episode, that's exactly how he got his start as a freelance war correspondent doing the same thing. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so this is like a, this isn't, I don't think, like a, a movie that Garland conceived as a commercial pro. I mean, I, I feel like this is, you know, like, he, these are th- themes that he cares about a lot as a person. Mm-hmm. Um, but but getting back to the characters. So, um, uh, so, so yeah, Mike, would you have anything else you want to say about these characters? Did you, did you like them? Did you dislike them? Did they seem believable? Like, how did you re- respond to them? They, they seem believable and I dislike them very much. Um, and uh, <laughs> uh, the, um, um, in their believability, right? Um, and, and that is really where these two things come together. Uh, I think that, like, you know, we're talking about what the film's about, and now we're talking about the characters, but the, but the answer to those two questions is the same thing. If you ask me, Garland is telling a story about the development of, of Jesse. Really, Jesse is the center of the story. You think Lee is, but, it, but really it's, it's the story of Jesse's development. And to me, it's her learning what ambition takes and what um, it costs you in your humanity um, on her path to to where Lee Lee comes, and I'm I'm not I'm going to avoid spoilers. We'll get to it in the end, but uh, in the beginning of the film, uh, we we know that that Lee very point uh, excuse me Jesse very pointedly asks Lee, you know, if I was shot, would you take and I was dying, would you take a picture of me? And Lee says, "What do you think?" And that's really queuing up the whole arc uh, a, a little bit ham handedly, to be frank. Um, but but here's where it intersects with what the film's about, is that if you look at a movie like 28 Days Later, which is this zombie apocalypse, although it's not zombie, it's, you know, people that are infected with a virus that makes them very angry, that the apocalypse itself and the zombies and that virus, they're, they're not what the film's about. They're a backdrop, right? The, they're they're a, a way for Garland to introduce drama into the situation. What the film's about is what human beings do to each other when the world goes away, Right. The same basic thing um, in Walking Dead. And, and I got the same exact impression here is that everyone's like, oh, my God, Civil War, this movie's about a war. It's got nothing to do with the war. The war is the window dressing that creates the, the stew for Jesse to develop in and for Lee to be jaded in and for these other uh, uh, characters to support their their sort of dance together across it. So both the characters arc and, and frankly, they're very much unlike ability, although they're very realistically portrayed. Uh, is what the film's about, if you ask me. Well, actually, let me bring up. So one other thing Garland said in interviews is that when he was sort of, you know, brainstorming the idea and he was telling people about it, a a Hollywood friend of his said, don't he's like, I want to make a movie where journalists are the heroes. And his friend Mm -hmm. said, oh, that's a terrible idea. Don't do that. Everybody hates journalists. (laughs) And he's, he's like, I thought that was really interesting and really disturbing because he says, you know, society needs journalists and you know what? Just what does it say that it's just this sort of axiom that that journalists are you know detested? Um, I would so. I would be so, I would be so curious if that if that what if that conversation was had say in like even in 2010 or 2008 versus today or even in the last two years because I I well, do I think what what a journalist does and what journalists' role is has really changed since Trump. Well, he he st- he said he started writing this four years ago, so um, yeah. it was it was in the past four years. I would imagine that this conversation would have taken place. Yes. Um, 
And I mean, you know, it's not like, and I don't think he's under any illusions that, I mean, this is not unjustified that people detest journalists <laughs> now. I mean, you know, there's pretty obvious reasons why that's happened, but it's not sure. a good, it's not a healthy um, development. Sure. Um, but, but yeah, why don't we just get through some of the plot um, so that we can, we can get to the themes, which, you know, I can tell everybody wants to talk about. So, so basically the, um, this, this group of journalists, they're on their, they want to take a road They're As I said, they're in New York city and they want to take a road trip down to uh, Washington, DC to be there when the Western forces take the Capitol and capture the president. Um, and so, um, so Joel, one of the characters, he really wants to interview, you know, get like an exclusive interview with the president, um, you know, before he's presumably executed or faces some sort of, you know, justice. Um, and so, so yeah, so so it's sort of sort of this road trip story where there are these this escalating series of disturbing encounters uh, with this fraying, you know, violent American society. Um, so, so Michael, kind of, how did that um, movement of the story work for you? The uh, you know, there's these these looters have been hung up in this car wash. There's uh, you know, I don't know, a couple of different things like that. How did that? How did that strike you? They were, uh, to me, so much it was gorgeously shot, which I which I would have expected. Um, you know, not not only from Garland, but also A twenty four as a um, as a production company has has really become uh, kind of known for the, just some of these gorgeous shots they do. I I I, I adore them. Um, so I mean, it was it was really well shot. Um, it was it was difficult to. Um, and I found this throughout the movie to, to attach to it um, and respond to it very emotionally because the movie is working so hard, I think, to detach, right? Be, it, because it's trying to, um, you know, these journalists, uh, their, their uh, pursuit of objectivity and their pursuit of, you know, we're, we're not going to actually take sides. We're just here is so kind of cold and, and, it, you know, correctly done for what what's trying to be displayed, um, that it, it made it kind of difficult to to, to care much, um, which I I found um, I found kind of up, upsetting in a, in a way that like I'm seeing these horrible things and I should care and I kind of just don't um, and I'm and I'm sort of trying to figure out as as a as a viewer uh, is that because that's what I'm supposed to like that that I'm being uh, you know, sort of led down that path, you, you're, you're not going to care. And then maybe you'll feel guilty about that. And that teaches you a lesson this way or that way or something. Um, or is it just like, this is going to be the inevitable cost of having a, a sort of hyper objective viewpoint and, and creating a movie that is journalistically looking at journalism at, at time of war, it's going to be this way. So I, I actually found it weirdly disconnecting and each one of those kind of you know stations along that journey um, more disconnected me, uh, which which was which was very strange um, and and kind of not what I expected. I expected to become more engaged, uh, and it really it really had quite the opposite to me. Well, I, don't, I, don't I, know I actually that, hadn't uh, occurred to me until you were just talking now, but it, it does seem maybe it was a conscious strategy. Um, on Alex Garland's part to to have this contrast of incredibly beautiful, like everything in the movie that's not combat is incredibly beautiful. And then the combat is made as off-putting and ugly and sort of pathetic and gross as possible. And I wonder if that was a conscious choice. I mean, like the shots of like the uh, the sprinkler spinning and like the burning embers floating through the air. I mean, there, there's so many shots that are, you know, the water when they're sitting beside the river, the, yeah. the mm -hmm. water sparkling. I mean, there's so much of the um, the environmental sh shots are so beautiful. And then the combat is just made so ugly. I do wonder now if that was a an intentional choice, you know. Oh, I, I think it, it almost assuredly was, right? You know, I mean, again, this is something that I, I did expect that walk in because Garland um, does that so well. Um, in Annihilation, for instance, right, you have these these gorgeous, uh, you know, colorful, engaging depth of field, um, and then you know something kind of horrific happens to somebody. But even that horrific thing, it it, it it's kind of aesthetically be beautiful. Like <laughs> you know, you're like this is this is horrible, this is bad. But but also, isn't that kind of extraordinary how that how leaves are coming out of that person, right? So there's these. 
these, uh, these, these strange current dichotomies that he deals with. Um, and, and so I did expect that. And we, we did get that here. I think it's very deliberate. And, and again, for, for what it's doing, very well done. But, but at least for me as an audience member, it, it just, I was disconnected so quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. No, I was I was agreeing with Mike. I think he he really summed it up uh, for me exactly. Uh, and and I do I do absolutely think that the juxtaposition of the beautiful and the horror and and then something sort of jumping out and and you know you we well again I don't want to jump ahead too far, but there are many many places where that happens in this film um, is absolutely a conscious choice on on Garland's part, um, and we certainly see that. in Mike brought up Annihilation as a great example of where he does that before. Um, I, I do think that that Garland's choice to kind of, uh, you know, make these characters look, he, he's showing human beings. And um, I think he's I think that a lot of times I certainly do this in my own work, uh, in my novel writing. And I, I, I think a lot of it's certainly done in film as well, is that people will make choices to create a dramatic arc in a character. And there was something relentless. Certainly there was a dramatic arc in the characters that I've explained before, but there was a relentless commitment to the reality of um, especially Lee and Jesse's presentation that creates that disconnection that Mike is describing. And I do think that that was a conscious choice on Garland's part. Look, great artists push the envelope with every single thing they do. Um, they're not going to repeat themselves. And, and Garland has already shown the world that he can do, you know, endless, amazing post-apocalyptic um, films. And, you know, here, you know, what's he going to do that's different and, and that's going to level up uh, again, and I don't think it's I'm going to do a movie about a civil war at a time when America, a lot of people would argue, is on the brink of a civil war. I don't think it's that at all. I think it's that exactly that, that I'm going to create these characters that are absolutely unvarnished in their humanity. And I mean, in their in the awfulness of their humanity, which creates that disconnection, I think that Mike was experiencing. I mean, it's it's interesting because I mean, I'll just say I, I really liked this movie. I, I thought it was great. Um, so I did not feel that sense of disconnection. I mean, I, I feel mm -hmm. like as an audience member, I'm fairly, um, tolerant of dislikable characters. I mean, but mm -hmm. I, I actually, I, I, I liked these characters. I mean, like they have their flaws for sure. I mean, but there's a lot of charisma. There's a lot of charm. I mean, like when, um, when they, there's a scene, so there's a scene in the middle somewhere where they go to this kind of like, um, uh, like suburb, this sort of like seemingly peaceful suburb. Yeah, that's to buy the, the dress shopping scene. <laughs> yeah, and and I just you know when um when Joel is trying on the hat and stuff, there's just like moments and you know um uh, uh Lee tries on the the green dress and stuff. I mean, I just liked the characters. I liked spending time with them, and I I saw their uh you know their their their, their emotional detachment as sort of a necessary and not to me very surprising um necessity for the sort of work that they do i mean i don't i don't know but it didn't i didn't judge them harshly for for being the sort of people that that sort of work had made them inevitably into was was how yeah, i saw it yeah and it's possible that i'm too close to it um look you know uh you know i'm not a journalist um but i fought in a war and i i i, I you know, I, I've been pretty public about my own um, struggles with PTSD and, and working with other um, people who deal with it. And one of the things that I've always found that's so counterintuitive is that my experience with, with, with traumatized people is, is not detachment, but it's actually more expressive emotionality and often very inappropriate expressions of emotionality. So f for me, I guess it was hard to square that circle of my own personal experience with the kind of like iron um, uh, uh, sort of almost like stony silence of, of, of Lee and, and what Jesse's character evolves into, um, and sort of how that, uh, the ambition of her career tracks with it. And it may be that my, that just uh, dovetailed too close with my own personal experience of, of that thing. But that didn't ring true to you that Lee's sort of jaded, detached, I distant mean, I sort of. Surely that exists, right? Human beings are incredibly varied, um, and our reactions to trauma are incredibly varied. But one of the things that's been so frustrating for me, and I, I've written about this and, and was just on a, interviewed on a, on a firefighting podcast and on a, um, American Institute of Stresses podcast on what I think, you know, the, the portrayal of PTSD gets wrong. And, and that is a big one is just sort of like the, the strong, silent type guy, you know, drinking his feelings away in silence at the back of the bar, not talking to his family. And, and I'm sure that like that happens. Again, I want to be clear, but by and large, my experience of it has been just 
walking open wounds, you know, lots of crying, lots of shouting, lots of, you know, inappropriate expression of emotions and failure to appreciate time, condition and place uh, when you're when you're, you know, having a moment. Um, so it's it's and, that, and that's something I really wish that the, the media would um, would get. Uh, and I'm using air quotes again. Right. Um, but I do think, again, that like when you're trying to create likable or interesting characters in a dramatic arc, you know, having someone who's blubbering and breaking down every five seconds and, and, you know, isn't making dramatic speeches, but instead is like incoherently babbling about, you know, uh, you know, what happened to them or, or, or how they think the world is out to get them, um, or is, is, is like immersed in self pity, you know, that really doesn't make for a great story. So a lot of times, you know, the media, even the nonfiction media will, We'll veer away from those um, portrayals. Well, it's interesting because just from what I've seen of the reaction to the movie, I mean, it's it's had a pretty polarized response, I think. But it seems that even the people who don't like it have praised Kirsten Dunst's performance. And so it's interesting that, you know, um, maybe like me, most people don't have enough of a you know familiarity with with these sorts of situations to, to judge. But it seems, you know, plausible to me and, and maybe to most um, theater goers that kind of works for <laughs> Oh, let, let me be clear. I am. Not, that was some amazing acting. Like the the acting, I have no complaints. <laughs> this is a collection of of professionals at the top of their game. You know, everyone from the DP to the cinematographer to the audio to the soundtrack to the actors. That's not what I'm saying at all. Um, yeah, again, like it, it's just uh, how that squares with my personal experience of it. Uh -huh. Um, but so I want to get back to Michael. So I guess, is there anything else to say about like, c could you imagine any tweaks to this story that would have made it work, connect more with you emotionally or, or not? Well, I, it'd be, it'd be hard, right? You know, cause you have to, something has to give, right? Either you're going to give on your message or you're going to give on, you know, uh, what I think is believable to the audience, you know, as, as Mike uh, is sort of indicating, right? There's a popular conception of things, and then there's a real conception of things. So perception versus reality, right? Um, and sometimes perception is more true. And as a filmmaker, you you have to sort of, well, I'm going to go with that, right? Because I want to get this message across. Um, and 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 the actors, the actresses, they 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 all, I'm, I'm top to bottom, were extraordinary. Um, really were. Uh, so I mean, people are are right to you know, say that Kirsten John Dunst just nailed the role. I mean, I think she did. Um, and I, and I, you know, I think Jesse did a, a, the, the, the young actress who played Jesse did such a fantastic job of sort of showing her, her kind of closing off, um, through this process. So I mean, it, for what it was trying to do, it was, it did it very well. It didn't, it didn't necessarily connect with me. Um, you know, the other thing that I thought was, was kind of difficult, um, it, you know, for me at, at least was, this kind of parade through uh, how horrible everything is and ended up raising questions that, you know, probably just for me as like a military historian, like my head's going in places that probably nobody else is right. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm like, okay, so they're stopping this gas station. Okay. What is the situation um, by which gas stations are still actually in business? They're there, you know, yeah, gas is in somewhat short supply, but, you know, how is it that the logistics are still like I'm my head's going into these these kind of like bigger issues that the movie just doesn't care about. It 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 wants to deny all that for this, you know, to have this moment of tension. Um and one of the yeah. uh, problems I also had was like, you know, I kept wanting to like, okay, you know, how would I figure that out in reality? And, and it just I had to kind of come to sort of accept like this is just a fantasy, right? And I just need to check all that at the door. Um, because, cause Garland's not caring about that. He's, that's not what he's interested in. He's interested in this other thing. So, um, it well, would have been hard to make it kind of realistic, if you will. Yeah. Well, cause I, I watched it, I rewatched it last night with my wife and, and she had a lot of trouble, you know, she kept wanting me to stop and explain, wait, so, so which faction are these guys with and which <laughs> faction are these guys with, you know, right. and what yeah. are the factions right. and stuff. And it was really a huge sort of stumbling block for her. I didn't yeah. have that at all. I mean, there's a scene in the, it seems like the movie anticipates this objection, explicitly because there's this scene where there's these two soldiers and they're pinned down by a sniper and and joel basically asks them you know like who are you guys who are you shooting at and they're like what are you an idiot like they basically say like it doesn't matter like if somebody's shooting at you like and the movie seems to be saying this to the audience it's like look once people start shooting each other all the all the reasons that they have in their mind for why they don't like each other just all none of that is, that's all just bullshit that doesn't matter anymore. Like just the reality of, 
of the carnage just washes away all the philosophy. Yeah, I, I, I found that to be a, I mean, that's kind of a lie. So, so like that, I found that really kind of bothersome. They, they, I, and I got it that they're like, oh, just don't worry about it. You know, just don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. But it's like, no, it, it intrinsically matters, right? You know, when, when people are trying to murder each other, they're, they're doing so for, for purposes. It's, it's ingrained in it. And to sort of say, no, 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 it just doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's just about the violence. Um, like that's the human history of how violence functions is against that. So, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I remember that moment and I, I, I didn't have a kind of relief from that. I had a, a how dare you? Like, like, do you know anything about warfare? Like that's, what are we doing? Uh, so yeah, I, I actually found that more bothersome than, than, uh, than as opposed to kind of letting me off the hook in that regard, unfortunately. Uh, I mean, Mike, what did you think of that scene? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm with, uh, I'm with Mike on that one. Um, you know, and I've been in situations where, um, you know, I don't know who's shooting at me and, and also in Iraq, like half the time, you know, you're rolling with IPs or you're rolling with, excuse me, Iraqi police or Iraqi national guard. And any one of them could be a solderite. Um, and a lot of times, you know, you're, you're coming up on a checkpoint and you don't know who it is. Um, and at no point, um, was anyone I was with or working with unconcerned about who was shooting at or, or shooting back. And especially again, um, and I brought this up before in the age of social media, when so much of, of, and this is almost something I wish Garland had leaned into more is that when you look at, you know, one of the things that I think he did really well in that scene is sort of evoked the gas in the gas station scene and, and the fight at the school. And then in that Christmas village scene that you're evoking is this sort of time of troubles, you know, as opposed to formed military units fighting formed military units. Um, although there is plenty of that in the film, which I, I certainly took issue with um, the sort of time of troubles, you know, insurgents, you know, not really knowing, you know, uh, what's going on that him leaning into. But in the age of social media, where how a war plays to the public, um, and I certainly think that even even in a society that's breaking down, um, that is highly, highly relevant. I mean, we certainly we see that, you know, for example, the Houthis um, uh, uh, adventures in the sea or, or um, what's going on in the Horn of Africa or in Sudan. So much of that is playing out on social media with the belligerents really, really leaning into um, you know, the, the war in Gaza right now that you see um, influencing public opinion. And that is only going to accelerate, right? Uh, how we fight wars is absolutely changing. So who you're shooting at and why you're shooting at them is more critical than it's ever been. Um, and I think it's, that's going to continue. Now, certainly friendly fire happens and people are going to, um, you know, make mistakes and stuff like that. But the not caring part of it, I mean, I guess I could see that well, in isolated pockets, like, it, like an apocalypse now style, but I, I, yeah, I am very much with Mike on that. Yeah. So, so let me just ask you, so, so that, that bit of dialogue didn't ring true to you. The idea that a soldier being shot at would say something like that, just sort of seems phony to you or well and also like if i'm if I, especially in a sniper spotter position if like you know like if i'm a sniper spotters man you are really freaked out about your flanks and all of a sudden some dude shows up next to me and is asking me questions and i don't know who they are and people aren't wearing uniforms i am not going to be calmly focused on the guy at the other end of my scope i'm going to be losing my mind why are you on my left like that part was was really blowing me up but again i i turned to uh, what Mike says is that, that is that this movie is not about a war. This movie is a, a backdrop to create tension so that we can look at these amazing characters develop. I mean, it does seem to me that thematically for what Garland is trying to say, like leaving the realism of the situation aside, it seems to me one reading of this, one very likely reading of this movie is that, you know, look, you guys are all fighting all the time and calling each other Nazis and communists and fascists and all this stuff. And all this stuff is just going to you're like LARPing like that you're in this great war and stuff. But when it when the shooting starts, all that stuff is just not going to matter. It's not just, you know, like the shooting then becomes the reality. And, and you, it's like this this like fucked up reality that you instantiated through this uh, overheated rhetoric. Um, mm. Do you guys buy that as a interpretation of at least what Garland is intending to communicate through this, through this scene? I, I, you know, I, I do think he's, he is trying to sort of say, you know, like, uh, 
I mean, it's cliche, right? You know, your war is hell, right? And you don't, you don't want it. Um, yes. And that is true. Um, you know, as, as someone who studies war, yes, you do not want it. Right. You know, and people that are like, you know, and I, I, we just, we just need to have a second civil war. Like, you know, 25, I'm, I'm, I'm recording this from Charleston, South Carolina, uh, with about 25% of the, the male population of South Carolina, the white male population died. Like, no, it's not good y'all. Like, but, but yeah, people, as you say, kind of LARP it, you know, they want to, they want to kind of cosplay this. Um, and, and as a sort of warning, uh, that, that that's not what you want. Yeah. Okay. But, but you also sort of undercut that, at least to me, by saying, you know, oh, but it doesn't really matter what you're fighting for. Um, no, it, intrinsically, like what you're fighting for is why you're fighting. Like, so you, you can't divorce those things. And, and all of those little, little moves, um, you know, as, as Mike said, you know, the, I, I almost laughed in the theater when uh, they, they, in that Christmas uh, village scene, you know, where they kind of pull up and there's, and there's a sniper and spotter there and the sniper and spotter are just like, you know, Hey, what's going on? Like, what, what did you, <laughs> are, did you talk to nobody about what this would read like? And I just, you know, that, that kind of constant, you know, yeah, maybe, uh, you know, he's again, I just, I had to say, this is fantasy. Um, this has no connection. Um, because otherwise it, it is, it becomes kind of incoherent. Um, and so I just have to concentrate on this as a message. And, and yes, one of those messages is very much war as hell. I don't think that's the message of the movie. And I think it's really built around journalism, but, um, uh, but certainly that backdrop is, you know, nothing good comes of this. Um, and that is absolutely true, right? Even in the moments of, of, uh, you know, kind of somebody won, um, uh, Garland is very careful to undercut those images, um, you know, and unsettle it and make it not okay. Right. That, that nobody, you, you can't sort of look at any scene of warfare in that film and think, well, that was just really cool. Right. I wish I was. <laughs> yeah. There. yeah. Right? There, yeah. There's, there's nothing like that. He, he's, yeah. he's very deliberately done that and, and very well done that. Um, and, and, and that's, again, that's part of that kind of like, he's just so good at tension, right? There's even earlier in the scene, there's a, um, uh, on one of the first nights on their journey, uh, Joel is talking with Jesse and, um, the way that Garland has shot that and the dialogue, you, you're, you're almost worried that, that Joel is going to do something to Jesse. Um, like, you know, oh, oh my God, is he going to like assault her? Is he, you know, like, what, like there's just a really unsettled feeling, right? It's that nothing is allowed to feel okay. Um, and certainly if you want to attach that to, you know, yeah, a civil war would not be okay. Yes, I agree. And I think Garland yeah. would agree. Yeah. <laughs> civil war. Yeah. Well, let's talk about, <laughs> so the, these, this, the, these sort of horror vignettes in the second act climax with this scene where um, so, uh, Jesse and another journalist who we who we just have, have briefly been introduced to gets get um detained by these this these three soldiers we don't know what side they're on they are perhaps not on any side anymore and they're like dumping bodies into a mass grave and the other characters you know lee and joel and sammy um have to make a decision and uh and they decide they're going to try to intervene and and you know try to uh, de-escalate the situation and so the so you have this sort of psychopathic soldier character played like by the inimitable Jesse Plemons. Um, and it's actually a really interesting story. So there was another actor who was actually cast to play that role. And that actor dropped out at the last minute and Alex Garland was freaking out. And Kirsten Dunst, who's married to Jesse Plemons, said, well, you know, Jesse's visiting with the kids. You know, he could maybe do it. And it's just... <laughs> It's like incredible and in really hearing is. that because you would think he was the first person they would call for this yeah. for this part. But um he it's also it. amazing. It's also amazing how you sort of incidentally luck into that major role. You know, he will be remembered for that for his entire career. I mean, people would kill for that part. And he's like, Oh yeah, my husband will do it. He's here with the kids. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so so Mike, what was your kind of how did you respond to that scene? It's, uh, it's one of the best it? scenes in the film and one of it's such a 
it's flawless. It's so great. And so, and of course, I don't mean great. Like I enjoyed it. Like I want to crawl out of my own skin, but it resonated in every nerve of my body for everything I've seen in, you know, working in counterinsurgency for, uh, for most of my professional career. Um, and, uh, you know, we were just making criticisms about, um, you know, realism that was so hyper realistic. And what made it even more uncomfortable for me, um, is that I, you know, I, with COVID, I left Brooklyn, this very urbane left leaning part of the country. And I moved up into Trump country about two hours north of New York city. And I spent most of my time out here, um, with a lot of very, very disaffected, very, very right leaning folks. Um, and, uh, just that, like if the world, when I, when I think about, you know, and look, I, I feel a lot of, you know, especially with Trump's conviction, I remember sitting on the couch when I heard it thinking, oh my goodness, what's going to happen next. And when I picture doomsday scenarios and wonder, you know, what could happen, that is the scene I see, uh, depicted just like that. And in fact, Garland depicting it that way has helped really crystallize it in my mind. I, I just think it's, it's, it was a real triumph of cinema and I think it's going to be remembered for a very long time. Yeah, I'll, I guess I'll just explain. So what happens in the scene is that you have this this soldier and he kind of asks asks all the, the journalists where they're from and starts shooting the ones who don't have a, you know, re- quote unquote real American enough answer. Um, and so, yeah, so it's it's really, really disturbing. And he sort of has this like affectless quality, Jesse Plemons, as an actor that's just really, really unsettling. Um, you know, he's not... Um, you know, frothing at the mouth, you know, he's, he's, he's just sort of seems to not really give a fuck about anything. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, so that's sort of, I don't know, Mike, uh, Michael, was there anything else you want to say about that scene or should we move on to? to God, it was brilliant. It was brilliant. I mean, you know, Plemons played it so well. Um, and, and see like that moment did sort of ring true. Like, like this person does have, um, something that they are killing for, right? He does have motivation. He, it's not just, oh, well, we're just killing, man. That's what, that's all this is. Like, no, 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 no. I have got a reason for what I'm doing. It, it may be a like horrific reason, right? But he does have a reason. Um, he does have a coherency that way. And, and, you know, and therefore it's like this just magnetic character and, and, and Plemons just, I mean, he kind of eats the screen in any role he is. He's, he's amazing. Um, I did not know that, that, that he was not, he just kind of fell into this cause my God, he's just so perfect for it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, he, 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 he might get an yeah. Oscar for that and he's on the screen for so small a time, but. Apparently uh, he also, he went around to all these little gift shops in the area and bought all these different sunglasses to, to try to. Oh pick my God. The, the uh, right. well he nailed it with the ones he had. Those are, those are perfect. <laughs> perfect. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's terrific and it, and and that, as Mike said, kind of that felt more real, right? And that felt more like, um, it, you know, that that kind of uh, asymmetrical sort of fighting um, that is that is kind of more reality, right? And it is more motivated. Um, yeah, that that is an absolutely chilling scene, uh, unforgettable. Um, even even down to the, uh, I mean, not to gross anybody out, right? But you know, there as they're dumping the bodies, right. They're concerned, you know, like, well, some of them aren't sliding off the back of the truck, you know, like that, that that's what their concern is. Um, you know, what an annoyance this is, um, is yeah, that's, there's a palpable horror to that, that, that actually does sadly kind of speak more to reality than a lot of the other things you see on screen. Well, it's interesting too, because they took this, you know, like, like I said, you know, Clemens just kind of happened to fall into this this role and then they basically made the whole trailer you know that scene you know it's like that scene intercut with you know uh monuments blowing up and stuff like that and so yeah so i mean i, I hear what you're saying that that by actually making by by foregrounding the ideology in that scene it sort of sort of gives it this grounding and this power i do worry i i do wonder though i mean that scene is so disturbing and so memorable like I, I i feel like you couldn't make the whole movie like that you know if, if you did make the this overt racism or whatever you know throughout it, the it whole becomes, movie it might it might just be too disgusting to to watch the movie you know but it, yeah. also, but it would also go against again if if i really think that garland is trying very carefully to avoid that right he he's not 
if you, if he, I think Garland, and look, I'm, I don't know the man's mind, but I think that he knew that if he made a movie about the civil war we all fear is coming, no one would pay attention to the movie. No one would pay attention to the characters. There would be only one topic of conversation, and that would be how it maps on to the current political scenario. And, and I think that Garland is too canny a, 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 a creative to do that. And, and so, like, he, he avoided that very specifically. And, and there is a film uh, of the one you're describing. It's called The Killing Fields, right? And we've all seen it. I think we've all seen it. Um, and it's this kind of relentless slog. It's really like, it's a great movie. I don't, I would not, would not call it a bad movie, but you don't want to watch it more than once. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I mean, again, it seems like Garland's, I don't know what I'm hearing is sort of Garland's made the best choices, you know, like, like it doesn't seem like people are saying like, Oh, he just, he really screwed up here. It seems like given the constraints he was working with, he kind of made candy, like Mike's word, candy choices. Yeah. For this yeah. I, I think, you know, he, he was, he set out to, to, to make a certain kind of movie and I, I, I he did, I mean, he, he succeeded at that. Um, yeah. And, and people kind of want it to be something that it's not, um, you know, are, are obviously going to be disappointed. Um, as, as one is with, with any work of art. Right. You know, I mean, I, w- I would have done it this way. Well, yeah, but you weren't doing it. So like, what are we going to do here? You know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it is, uh, as you said, if you would have had an, a, a full movie that was nothing but that. Yeah. It would have been the killing grounds, um, uh, or the killing fields, excuse me. Um, and, and that, uh, and that's not, I mean, yeah, it's a hell of a movie, but, ugh, you know, like, like we've, we've done it. Can we, can we see something else? And <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll mention too, I mean, this movie's done quite well. It's, you know, made over a hundred million dollars and it's this sort of, you know, a 24 is more of an indie kind of studio. And this is the second most, um, uh, you know, highest box office movie they've done after um, everything everywhere all at once. And um, so, yeah, and and I saw a kind of interesting, according to exit polls, the audiences have been a pretty evenly split, um, you know, liberal versus conservative. So, you know, it, it does seem like, you know, he was successful in, in making this movie that, you know, did not just come across as sort of partisan or, um, yeah, you know, only appeal to half the audience or whatever. Yep. Uh, okay, but well, let's talk about Act Three. So in Act Three, we see the you know the Western forces. So we've got all sorts of tanks and helicopters and and soldiers all taking the capital and the uh, you know and the we're we're told there's only sort of a, a kind of a token resistance of some diehard soldiers and um, Secret Service agents who are still protecting the White House. Um, so Mike, kind of what was your, uh, reaction to that third act? Uh, yeah, again, like I, I may be a little too close to it. Um, um, this was the most actiony part of the film. Um, and there's a couple of things I get hung up on, um, in, in, uh, depictions of war. Uh, the first is there's a lot of shooting on firing on full auto or on burst, um, which there's just none of that in any experience I've ever had. Um, you know, I'm certainly, um, other, um, folks who are actual pipe hitters and, and, um, combat arms folks may disagree, but, um, you know, in CQB close quarters battle that I've seen, there's a lot of single shots. There's a lot of, you know, zero dark 30 does it really well in depicting, um, how the seals take the compound in the end of that film. There was just sort of like a lot of actiony choices that I saw there. And the other thing that I really stumbled over, and it may just be that I've never dealt with embeds like that before, but the journalists are moving in the stick with the, um, sorry, the, you know, the stack of the, of the operators as they're, as they're breaching and clearing. And I just, I mean, maybe that happens. I've never seen it. There were plenty of, um, journalists around the operations that I participated in. Um, I, I will tell you what, you know, I would never tolerate that. You know, if I'm, if I'm going into a, a shooting situation, you know, certainly if, 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 you know, my commanders told me there are going to be journalists in the area, I'll be careful, but they're not going to be, I'm not going to be grabbing them by the shoulder and shoving them in the stick. And it may be that, that an actual operator um, would have a different perspective, but I don't think so. So that, that was a really difficult for me. Now in Garland's defense, he's trying to tell a story here and he needs his journalists to be in the heart of the action. And certainly as a novelist, I've made those kinds of deliberate decisions in the past to fudge things, even when I knew better, because I had to propel the story and they are the way that the story gets propelled, which may be what happened. But again, as with the PTSD stuff, I think I may be a little too close to it um, uh, 
to uh, uh, for it to have stuck. But I will say that the the end of the character arc with Lee taking the round and Jesse taking the picture, which was so brilliantly foreshadowed at the at the helicopter scene in the beginning of the film, like it is a little heavy handed, but it's so delicious and so brilliantly done, and it really cemented. The arc of, again, for me, these characters are very unlikable for that reason. But again, that wasn't a problem for a lot of other viewers. But it really slams the door on what Garland is trying to do, which is show Jessie's transformation in service to her calling um, and what that costs her in terms of humanity. And you see it also with Joel, who is so grief stricken by the slaughter of his friend in that um, mass grave scene that we described, sort of cynically turning away from Offerman as the president as he summarily executed. And as these soldiers pose with the corpse, which of course, as we know, is a war crime, which again is, is Garland's comment, you know, you don't want this, this warning of, of uh, what, of what a glorious victory looks like. So it was a really difficult third act for me. But ultimately, it was one of the more satisfying um, parts of the film. Yeah, let me just flesh that out. So when the so these these soldiers, these Western forces soldiers, uh, you know, apprehend the president, and they're about to summarily execute him, and Joel jumps in. He's like, "Stop, stop!" And and again, I had some plausibility issues with, like you're saying, with the way that the journalists, um, with the with the deference or you know participation that these soldiers give these journalists. I mean, maybe that is what it's really like. Being a photojournalist, I have no idea, but it struck me as is impossible watching it. But so anyway, so he jumps in and says, wait, wait, I need a quote. And the president says, don't let them, you know, pathetically, you know, snivelingly says, don't let them kill me. And he says, that'll do. And he's like, go ahead. You know, now you can kill him. And yeah. it's like, yeah, it's it's a really like dark, memorable, effective end to the movie. I'm a little bit baffled when Garland says that he made this movie to um push back against the idea or to like make the journalists heroes because the ending the journalists do not seem like heroes at the end it's at least very um ambiguous whether they're heroes or not so i'm a little bit puzzled by i mean he may, I mean, maybe you know maybe he's just you know enough of an artist that he you know uh, heads into the complexity and the ambiguity regardless of what his you know initial yeah. or stated yeah, so and I said this earlier, Dave. Um, look, uh, you know, it's sort of an axiom in fiction writing, and I think Michael will agree with me here. You're constantly taught to make your characters compelling and likable, and people should identify with them. And and you hear likable all the time, likable, 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 strong, strong, strong. And I don't like rules in writing. And I, th I think of Holden Caulfield's character as one of the most celebrated characters in American literature, who's this sniveling jerk. Um, and look, you know, um, sometimes people can be human and sometimes humans are awful. And I think that just be like people say, you know, you know, I did not like these characters, but that doesn't mean I wasn't compelled and moved and transported by them. And I wonder if. Just as we're, you know, a lot of people expected Garland to make a movie that maps onto our current political situation. We're expecting him to follow these kind of rules of, of fictional character development. And maybe he's good enough of an artist to refuse to do that and to try to show human beings in all of their transcendent awfulness. Uh, I didn't so, like the ending. <laughs> okay, good. Okay. So tell us, tell us more about that. Yeah, I, I, I didn't care for the ending. And, and it was, um, in, in, in part, kind of like what both of you are saying, um, you know, I had problems with the kind of military aspects of it. And, you know, how are you people going through this much ammo? And we have like F-22s flying overhead because it looks cool or something. And you're like, but like, why are you why are you engaging in this kind of land battle when you don't really care? Just bomb him. I, it was it, all kinds of weirdness. Um, and, yeah, stacking the, 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 the photojournalist was was very strange. Um, but it was that the heavy handedness of, of that arc that she was going to go, Oh, now I'm going to take a bullet for this girl. Um, didn't land for me. I, I thought it was too, uh, too obvious, I guess. Um, and, and so it, it kind of, it felt empty. Um, and, and also that, you know, Joel's, um, you know, pursuit of this quote, right? I'm going to get this kind of lurid quote and then, and then we'll get the money shot of him being, you know, being blown away by, by this high powered weaponry at point blank range. Um, like 
so so what happened to our message of you know as you said david um you know journalists are heroes um it 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 to me deeply undercut the message that objectivity is good right you know if if you're saying hey look we have to be objective we can't be engaged it's not i, I believe you know lee says at one point um it's not our job to ask the questions. We take the pictures so that others can ask the questions. I'm like, oh, okay. I, I, I get that, right? You know, and so, okay, that's what we're going for. We don't want to both, we're just, we're be trying to be objective. And as I said, I think that's baked into the movie and that's, and that's why it, it kind of feels cold in some ways because it's, it's trying to be objective about what it's doing. It's trying to be journalistic about it. Um, but, but then yeah, I don't. I don't think better of of Joel or or Jesse for what they've done in the end. Um, I kind of I kind of think less of them, and and so I I, I left the movie like, well, 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 what the heck was that? Like, you, you know, there was there was some way this could have landed that that I would still have that message, uh, and and I and I feel like I just got it pulled out, pulled the rug pulled out. And, you know, again, maybe that's Garland's like, you know, yeah, I'm going to make a movie and, you know, I'm going to pull the rug out. And didn't I do that a great job? Like, OK, I guess you did. But he didn't make me like the movie anymore. Like and so, yeah, I found I well, found the ending just really incoherent in many respects. I, I do wonder, though, I mean, if he made the the journalist characters heroes in the end, then that would push back against his message of you don't want that. I mean, the whole movie, it seems to me, is intended to the audience as a message of you don't want a civil war and nothing in the movie is permitted to contradict that message. And so if if the final act of the movie was some sort of something heroic, you know, something that you, sh you would want to emulate as the viewer, you, the mood coming out of the movie would be maybe one of, you know, some sort of triumph or something, which is not what Garland wants you to, you know, he wants you to feel. Yeah, maybe, but you know, Abject at the same disgust, time, if, you know, if I don't, coming out of the theater, if I don't care about any of these people, then what do I care? You know, I mean, like, okay, like I don't. These people can, you know, all right, who cares? Like, so you know, it's, I mean, it, it, I, I kind of get that, but also, you know, to have your your audience invest, they they need to be invested, right? You know, I want you to get my, my message. I need you to be invested in the characters. Uh, so I, yeah, I, I found that just, that was very just discordant to me. Um, and not in a good way. I mean, other, other parts of the movie, I found that discordant, very interesting for the message, but yeah, the, the ending just, I, I felt like was, I was, I left just very deflated and not in a, like, you know, let me weep for the country, but in a kind of just like, well, oh, that was, I feel like kind of wasted at the end. Um, and, and I, I hate, I hate that because I, I like Garland so much. Uh, and and I, and I really wanted it to be to be something else. But but that's certainly how I left uh, the movie feeling. I mean, Mike, what do you think about what we're saying here? I mean, uh, I, I think actually, ironically, Mike and I are saying the same thing. It's just, uh, you know, I think we both felt that disconnect and that and that lack of um, I don't know how to say it, likability. But for me, again, I, I feel that's an artistic choice that really resonates. Like, I love. I don't know. I mean, I, I feel there's something really intimate and vulnerable about being frank with how horrible people are. You know, maybe I have a dim view of humanity, um, you know, and look, uh, you know, my, so much of my life right now is service. Um, and I, I just really think that, um, being frank about that awfulness and, and, and looking frankly at it is, is really where the, where the roots of compassion lie. You know, like when you, it's really easy to be nice and sympathetic and, and, and really identify with and, and show up for and see as we, the term that we love to use these days, people that, that are wonderful and, and, and resonant for us. Um, it's a lot harder to do that when people are horrible and people are often horrible. So I really appreciated that artistic choice. And I also really appreciated the boldness of it. Um, so it's interesting. I, I absolutely understand where Mike, Michael is coming from, but it just landed very different for me uh, for that reason. Yeah, I mean, I found the movie stunning. I mean, I walked out of the theater just sort of in awe of it. I mean, it wasn't until then later when I watched interviews with Alex Garland when he said my intent was to make the journalists the heroes. I was like, well, well I'm not really sure that's <laughs> what it did. Yeah. But I mean, but my experience watching the movie was, was uh, you know, 
it didn't it that didn't that's something that didn't really occur to me until later until yeah, and, 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 Dave, you've said um, your argument about it, it, of Alex Garland's central premise being a warning, I think, is absolutely right. And a lot of his artistic choices um, fall into there, too. I also wanted to uh, credit another argument you made when we were discussing the Christmas Village, when you talked about the arguments of opposing sides, especially now, being so bombastic and reactive and and constant in the age of social media that eventually you reach a point where they really don't matter anymore. And we're just killing each other because, um, you know, as I've chewed on that since hearing you say that a few minutes ago, it's really, you know, I think there's a lot to that. I don't know if that's what Garland intended, but I think that's a really smart way to look at that. Otherwise very, for me, at least discordant scene. Yeah. I mean, it just seems to me that you can't, you know, you can't call other people Nazis year after year after year and then not that not have bad you know consequence <laughs> consequences at some point like you know i mean i mean i guess unless it just becomes a widely understood hyperbole or something but it, it just seems like a really dangerous game and i think that's that that's i don't know that's that's how it struck me is that you know is that garland's garland's whole thesis here is like you you know you don't want a civil war like you talk a big game about how you do or you know you, you you're you're so you're so like um blase about it like here's what it would be like you don't don't want this let me communicate yeah. to that to you in the most you know unmistakable way that i know how to do yeah for sure you know it's really funny did you did you ever interview jim butcher on here dave i have yeah so it's so funny you know jim he once called me uh the person he liked the most who he disagreed with uh this is back you know in the days when our, our paths crossed, but I'll never forget. I was holding forth on Twitter and I was just being an asshole. I was making some kind of stupid, you know, bombastic political point. And he responded with a, a book cover that was a kid riding down a slide. And the title of the book was everyone I disagree with is Hitler. Yeah. Uh, a guy arguing. Oh, it was so, and it was, and of course I was furious at the time, but he was absolutely right. Um, and it's, and he was making a very prescient point that I think Garland is trying to drive home now and that you just made. Yeah, well, because, you know, so I came home from the theater um, and my wife was on the phone with her dad and she's like, oh, Dave just got home from a movie. She's like, oh, yeah, he saw this movie Civil War. It's about a civil war breaking out in uh, you know modern times, you know, and yeah. her dad was like, yeah, that could happen. You know, like it's just like it's just in the air how like like, you know, like like, you know, whatever, if 10 years ago I would have thought the idea, you know, like you can just imagine what what it would have been like if this movie had come out 10 years ago, it would have been like fun, you know, like escapist fun or whatever, you know, it's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. It's so horrifying that, that we go and watch this now and we're concerned about it mapping onto reality. Like I, I, you know, I was texting people when Trump got convicted, telling them, man, I, I really wish history would slow down. Yeah. Well, and then this, this being an election year, I mean, I've just never had so much dread, you know, yeah. and I, and it's just like, and, and Garland, you know, he, he wrote the story four years ago. It takes a long time to get a movie made. So, I mean, you know, but um, yeah, it's just, it, the, this movie just lands in a really particular way at this historical moment. Uh, I was going to say, like, maybe for people in the future, we should say, we should clarify that this is Trump's conviction for the hush money case, because who knows how many future convictions. I mean, there's like three other cases. Just like, in case there's <laughs> another one coming. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but oh, I want to get, I don't want to dwell, I don't want to dwell yeah, on that sure. point too much. Too um, I do want to, I mean, it's, it's getting back to Michael's point about, you know, why did they have, you know, the sort of close, oh, I guess I'll, I'll make one other point. Um, Alex Garland said about that corridor scene where there's the soldiers, you know, taking the, the White House sort of room by room. He said that they had three Navy SEALs and one Marine were like, you know, most of that group doing that, you know, real life, you know, Navy SEALs and Marine. So, I mean, there was at least, you know, a, a high level of, um, uh, what would you call it? Um, you know, expertise or, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe like, I mean, it, you know, Navy SEALs from where, you know, what team were they on? What were they doing? You know, and, and, and what, who's that Marine? I mean, I think there's a lot of like, you know, uh, you know, questions. I certainly had CQB training in the guard. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think it really depends, uh, on who's involved. 
Uh, yeah, consult I, consulting is the word I was looking for there. Yeah, but, um, and, I, and I'll say, you know, historical consulting or anything like that, um, you know, any, any time a filmmaker is like, oh, no, no, we talked to somebody. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I've gotten those calls, you know, where somebody says, OK, um, we're, we're about to shoot this scene and um, we need we need to know uh, what a 14th century door looks like. And you're like, oh, yeah, well, it looks kind of like this. I'm like, no, let, let me stop you there. Here's a picture of three doors. <laughs> which one of these is the 14th century door? And you're like, well, none of them, none of them. They're like, okay, yeah, but we're, sh we're shooting in five minutes, which one? And you say the one on the left, then they're like, cool. You know, the, his the history geek says it, that, that we're correct. Like, well, no, you're not right. But they've well, checked was, that box. Yeah. I was going to say, I mean, like, you know, it's a, it, at the end of the day, it's a movie and the director's making those calls. So it might be that the soldier, you know, it's like, I would have shot this guy three times and they're like, okay, we're going to need you to shoot him like 36 times, you know, <laughs> and you know, cause, cause empty the clip. Cause, cause just for the dramatic, you know, we want this, the sounds, the, you know, the over, you know, the, we want to overwhelm your senses, all this kind of stuff. I mean, yeah, this is the burst fire complaint that I made. Also the, the Hilo, like, you know, I, I you know, I can't remember if it was a Blackhawk or, uh, or an old, like a uh, longbow or something that was like, you know, in between these buildings, you know, so, super low to the ground. And I'm just like, why would you do that? That's extremely risky. And and again, you know, look, both Mike and I are novelists. We certainly understand um, sometimes you make, you know, considerations in the sake of dramatic narrative and, and, and you have to forgive that. There's a reason we have the term willing suspension of disbelief. Yep. Right. But the, the other thing I was, I was wondering, though, is that when you say, well, they could have just bombed the White House with the F-22s or whatever. But I mean, they need the body like they need pictures of the body to show that he's dead. Right. Because if they just demolish the White House to rubble and it's weeks before they dig all the bodies out, then you don't know if you've gotten him that whole time. Right. Am I am I wrong about that or? I, I mean, look, I've I've never I've never toppled a government, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I certainly don't know. Um, I, I think you're probably right. Um, and I certainly, again, one of the things that I, I said this before that I wish Garland had leaned into is the role in, uh, you know, look, we're, we're in what we call 5GW, fifth generation warfare, where so much of what war is, is influencing not the, the policymakers of the military, but the populace as well to carry on a contest. Um, and we do that um, with imagery. We do that with social media. Um, you know, this this is something that's been growing ever since the famous, you know, execution shot um, and the in the Vietnam War, um, where the that Viet Cong captain was summarily executed on the street. Um, and and that's only been growing. And now you see it in Ukraine. I mean, one of the reasons that uh, Ukraine Ukraine has been so successful against Russia has been the the social media war that they've been winning. Um, so yeah, I do think the need for a body. Uh, is critical, but then you get into posing with that body uh, uh, in pictures, which seems pretty, pretty uh, running against that. So, um, yeah, I, I really don't know. Um, all right, cool. So, uh, yeah, so that covers the plot. Um, I don't know. Does anyone have any other topics, any other like favorite characters or scenes or uh, reactions to the movie or anything they want to mention? I, I I don't. I mean, I, I you know, I would just say it was it was. Um, I mean, it's something to see, and and it and it does. Even if it's not about our political moment, it it, you know, it has a kind of responsiveness to it. Um, and and I mean, I don't want to sound like I'm being too down on the film. I mean, I just I, I had to in the end, you know, like force myself to to suspend my disbelief to to use the phrasing that uh, that Mike just uh, wisely brought up. Um, you know, even, even to the point of, you know, again, this, uh, posing all this as if it's, as if an, another civil war be, uh, dealt with on symmetrical warfare terms, which is, you know, to me ludicrous, right? That's just ludicrous, but it makes for a good film, right? It makes for a good, a good kind of film. It, it looks, you know, is there any utility to having F-22s fly over uh, Washington, D.C., not targeting anything? No, it's useless, but it looks cool on film. Like, it sounds really cool. So, you know, you just have to kind of, like, let that stuff go. Um, I would just, like, kind of warn people if, if anybody's kind of, like, watching it and being like, oh, like, this is reality. I'd be like, you, you know, that's that's LARPing, too, right? You know, you're, you're, you're actually doing the same thing, in a sense, that the people that are are, uh, are thinking, you know, man, I can't wait for the next civil war. I'm prepped for it. Um, you know, both of those things are, are, are kind of equivalent to me, you know, of, of living a fantasy. Yeah. I um, mean, 
Well, like when I interviewed Stephen Marsh, that was one of the things he said that that really struck me um, is that he's like so symmetrical warfare. We mean, you know, like there's like soldiers with guns and tanks and helicopters on both sides and they're fighting each other. And and, and he said, you know, that's not going to like 100 percent. That's not going to happen. No expert I talked to thought that was a possibility at all. He's like the U.S. military would pick a side and and do it as a unit. Um, and so I guess, Mike, you 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 um listen to that interview, right? Do you, you're also in agreement that, that this sort of symmetrical warfare is not. Really yeah. A- and, and it's such a brilliant, I mean, honestly, I've, I've, I, you know, 500, you know, how many episodes is, is Geek's Guide up to now? Five. This is 571. Okay. So like, <laughs> I, I'm, I, I feel no guilt at admitting I can't listen to all of them. <laughs> um, but that one, which I think you said was 512 is probably one of your best. Marsh is, he really is a light. Um, and he's such a brilliant guy and he's, you know, I really hope that your listeners will, who haven't listened to it, will go back and listen to it. And it's so funny because you, you asked about, um, characters that resonated with me. And, um, after I listened to Marsh's interview with you, I went and read his essay in the New York Times, I think last year, where he talks about on writing and failure and promotive promotion of his new book, which is just coming out about writing and failure. I mean, I don't know anyone who would call Stephen Marsh as a failure as a writer. And Sammy's character as this like really overweight, not mobile, not healthy older guy who is, you know, clearly going on a mission to get the story that he knows will kill him. And that will certainly endanger everyone around him because he's just not able to function and being so called to his work and being so, um, you know, broken down by its demands on him through his whole life. And he carries that weight again, brilliantly acted, brilliantly directed to get that out of him um, and I just kept thinking of Marsh's essay of, of what it means to commit yourself to writing and to journalism in particular. And I really, really hope that, that folks who are, are listening to this episode will listen to that interview with him and then go read that essay in the New York Times. It's worth subscribing to the New York Times to read, um, if you, uh, if you don't already. Um, but that, that really evoked the character of Sammy for me. Um, all right. So we're, we're pretty much out of time. So we should start wrapping this up. So, I mean, I'll just say again, I, I, I think I was, I liked this movie the most of, uh, of the three of us, but I, I thought it was terrific. Um, I mean, you guys know a lot more about relevant subjects than I do, but I think just for, I don't know, I think for the average person, um, it's a, you know, it's a really good movie. It's like the best American Civil War, you know, modern American Civil War movie I think you're likely to see uh, anytime soon. So, uh I wouldn't personally wouldn't miss it. And I think it has an important message that, you know, like guys just chill the fuck out. You know, <laughs> you're, you're, you're leading us down a road we don't want to go on. And I think it portrays that very vividly. Uh-huh. So let's all just take a breath. Um, on, that, on, that, on that note, I, I, I do want to say that, you know, I've tried very hard to um, be straight about my impressions of the film, um, but I certainly would also recommend that people go see it. I don't think, um, you know, this is certainly I would not call this a bad film. Um, I do think that if you're going, it, it certainly defies traditional movie going expectations um, and you may feel very uncomfortable with it. And again, you may have these experiences of not liking the characters, but I'd say it's it's certainly a very, very powerful, incredibly made film um and 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 i agree it should not be missed yeah yeah i just feel like i just feel yeah like garland is an artist you know and like whether you like this his approach here or not it's just made with a level of art and craft that like white house down you know or whatever like doesn't even (laughs) begin to approach so you know um 100 percent agree yeah um but yeah michael any other any final thoughts any other uh anything else you wanted to mention yeah, no, that's, that's, that would, that'd be exactly it. Right. You know, this, this does, uh, you know, Garland's the, the messages he's trying to get across. He, he gets them across. He, he knows what he's doing. Um, and it is uh, a wonderful thing. And, um, and you know, I, I said before, I, I really like a 24. Um, I, I, I don't know what it's like behind the scenes, but it sure seems like they, they give their directors, um, the leash, you know, they're like, Hey, you tell the story the way you think it needs to be told for what you think is important. Um, and you know, if it's successful, it's successful. If it's, you know, if it's not, we deal with that, right. It, it doesn't, it's not formulaic. They're not, uh, you know, trying to fight to make sure that we check certain boxes. It, it, it really is 
freeing to see a filmmaker making the film they wanted to make. Um, and, and I certainly got that feeling throughout this. Yeah. Yeah. Super impressed with A24 for green lighting in this in the first place. I'd be yeah. curious to hear what those meetings sounds <laughs> like. But uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, but so, Mike, final word. Um, yeah, no, uh, certainly um, go see it. Um, I just would. And, and yeah, go see it and, and do yourself a favor and leave your expectations at the door. Um, you know, let yourself you know, really, and also let yourself be uncomfortable. I think we have a weird, especially in America, expectation that, you know, one should leave entertainment feeling good. But the purpose of entertainment, we forget, is to evoke emotion, right? And to make us think. And sometimes that's going to evoke very uncomfortable emotion and make us think um, really, really dark thoughts. I don't think anyone would argue that Requiem for a Dream is a, hmm. is a bad movie. It's a great movie. But again, it's not a movie I want to see twice. Um, and I think that that actually speaks to its greatness more than anything else. So when you go see this film, go see it with that attitude. Yeah. Although I did see this twice and I liked it both times. So uh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> maybe I'm just the perfect audience for this movie. You might be. Um, all right. But why don't we uh, wrap things up there? So we've been speaking with Mike Cole and Michael Livingston. And again, their new book is called The Killing Ground, A Biography of Thermopylae. So thank you both so much for joining us. Our pleasure. Thanks so much for having us. And that was our panel. So big thanks again to Mike Cole and to Michael Livingston for joining us on the show. Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoyed the show and want it to continue, please support us on Patreon over at patreon.com slash geeks or via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening. And we'll see you next time.